to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is David Alston. A lot of times we have in our media a conversation about what New Brunswick needs to do. There are a few people who know how to do what we need to do. David Alston is one of those guests. You will hear him exploring some different processes and different systemic changes that we need to have in order for New Brunswick to take a step forward and be ready for what's to come. I hope you enjoy the interview. And if you do like the work we do, please support the program by clicking the link to Patreon in the upper right corner. And now, here's David Alston, his energy, his magic, and his vision. So thank you for coming. Oh, well, thanks for inviting me. And you have a new position with the provincial government. Mm -hmm. um, if you could describe a little bit of what we know it as the, on the surface. And then take us a bit deeper into what uh, you want it to grow to be. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So it, the, the position is called Entrepreneur in Residence, which for most folks would be like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> we picture you having a small apartment up somewhere in the civil service. <laughs> yeah, office. right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's completely virtual um, from that perspective. It's, it's a volunteer role. I don't have any... I don't have a government email. I don't have a. I don't have a desk. I don't have a parking spot. I don't have any of that kind of thing. It's. It's basically. Uh, it evolved over the last couple of years uh, from me just volunteering to kind of get involved more and more within trying to understand how I could help uh, with my experience. Tip typically, I've been in a lot of you know, tech startups, a lot of uh, marketing oriented roles, and so really, um, my background. If I had to describe myself as a bit of a systems thinker, so I always like to try to understand the inner workings of something, mm -hmm. see if there's ways to improve it. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly, with a machine the size of government, there's lots of, it's, it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube to try to understand all that, right? So as, so as a systems thinker, I'm like, wow, this, there is a lot to learn here. Um, and most folks would generally, when, when it comes to government, there's, if they see something that's not working, they're probably they get pretty frustrated and they probably rail against a little against the machine kind of well, why is it doing this I don't get it and then they probably go back to their lot their lies but in my case I guess I'm a bit cursed as I like to understand this stuff <laughs> so um, yeah I mean this role I start it started about three years ago unofficially because uh, we started uh, myself and others trying to understand how we could get coding back in the school system hmm. and. Um, and since then, I, I started understanding a bit more about how the education system worked. And then I was asked to be part of strategic program review as one of the three citizens that were sitting in on that. And that opened me up to a whole under really understanding how government worked behind the scenes there, too. It really does have its own auspices and its own breathing mechanism yeah. and its own nervous system. It yeah. really is an entity unto itself. Yeah, for sure. And I mean that with all the integrity because that's its role. Yeah. Was, and we've sort of lost some of the respect for that. Yeah, and, and the other thing is too is that um, if you try to compare it to the private sector, it is not like the private yeah. sector. Yeah. It yes. just isn't. So there's the tagline that it would. It's always been nice to try to explode a social myth so mm -hmm. we can make a step forward. Mm. So government should never run like a business because it's not a business. Mm. It, it's got all these other things. Now the intention might have been certain efficiency, in certain places, but the root of government isn't the same responsibility or role as a private sector. Yeah, I mean, it's if you think about government, how it would have if you had to reinvent government today, it's really uh, you know what I mean, right from scratch. Let's say you, you landed <laughs> on a planet, you had to be, right? Yeah. It's really about how to instead of all of us trying to do something together, let's pool our resources and yeah. and do certain things that just seem to make more sense pooled together. I mean, so um, and we'll all pay some money into that pool in yeah. order to do that. Um, and as the other thing that what's interesting is if you had to compare certain things to private sector experience, um, the larger an organization gets, the harder um, the harder it is for it to innovate and to make cha to change, right, uh, to adapt. It just it just gets harder, and that that's big corporations and everything else. Um, so uh, what's interesting about how big corporations um, choose to tackle innovation? Some of, yes, they'll have their own R&D departments, but they'll also acquire ideas. And generally, that you know, they're acquiring these startups over time in order to inject new ideas and new product and new thinking over time. Um, well, obviously, government's not going to acquire, you know, companies. That's not how it works, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the way it works. But it's 
when I when I started thinking over the last couple of years is that how can they acquire ideas? How can they acquire new ways of doing things? This is where um, the idea of um, social innovation labs, uh, collective impact uh, movements, that kind of thing, where ideas are formed from the citizen citizens getting together or nonprofits or people within, you know, groups within the community, creating a new kind of approach, testing it out, scaling it up, making sure it works. And then, you know, at the, some point government, you know, so I mean, when I say government, I mean the civil servants, civil service can kind of like collaborate and understand how that kind of works, see the social return on investment that it is created in terms of solving a problem, a mm. social problem, economic problem. And then, if it makes sense to then potentially, you know, I'll quote unquote, air quotes, acquire that idea mm. and then scale it up through the organization and kind of systemize it mm. or, you know, make it available throughout the system um, and as a way to constantly evolve and improve things. That was the one thing I noticed when I went into strategic program review. You know, it's a year long process and um, I didn't know anything about government or how it innovates or how it creates change. And I know when I was asked, I was like, well, one of the things I want to make sure is that when we do things uh, or when I'm involved in this process, it really is one of those things where if we're going to try to find ways to have government operate on less money mm -hmm. is let's look at things where we re-engineer things, not necessarily just chop things back, you know, yeah. trim a little this mm -hmm. up here, a little of that, because what happens is, as we all know in diets, we trim a little, you know, we change a few things, but yeah. then things just, if it's the same, we're eating the same habits, it'll just kind of just creep back again. Yes. And so it was, how do we look at ways to improve? Um, and what what I discovered as part of this process as a citizen is that government doesn't have an R&D department. They don't have a whole bunch of, you know, new approaches like sitting in the wings because they're not necessarily experimenting on that, partly because most of what government is involved in is service delivery. So they're, they've trimmed it down to the point where it's all about delivering services. And so experimenting with brand new ways, there's, there is no buffer for that. And so what I discovered during that strategic program review process is there really wasn't a lot of like new projects that you could literally just grab that were sitting in the hopper yeah. and say, well, we figured this all out. We know what, if we invest a dollar <laughs> this way, this is the way it worked. We just, yeah. They weren't there, partly yeah. because Things, it's not the way it worked in terms of government not having an own, its own R&D department. And so, you know, as a citizen, you were like, well, why don't they try new ways? Well, you have to give them the ability to try new ways. And so that's why I'm such a big fan of social innovation and working in social innovation labs and so on and so forth is because it gives government a chance to try new things with citizens yep. in a way that they can, you know, research and try stuff prove that it works, and then gradually start to refocus on things that maybe work better than the traditional ways. Yeah. So in a way, you're trying to help bring adaptation to the government system. Um, earlier, you talked about coding into schools, and, and be a fun point of tension in a way. Margaret Wente recently had an article in the Globe and Mail. Um, she was poo-pooing mm. coding in the schools. Um, her The point of her column sometimes is to poo-poo stuff to create attention and create a dialogue. And, um, so do you, you want to play with that? And in the comments below on YouTube or on Facebook, we'll put the link to Margaret Wente's uh, story. Mm. Because well, for you, it's, it's core almost. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and look, I get I get the point that um, one of the folks in that article was making, which is you know often um, various you know external forces come to bear on the school system. Well, we need more of this. We need more of that. Right. Yeah. And I get that. You know, and, and I get the whole aspect of flavor of the month or flavor of the year or whatever. Yeah. For me, um, it's, it was about getting, and I, you know, earlier I mentioned coding back into the school system. Yeah. Because when I was in, um, uh, way back yonder, when we still called them junior high schools before we called them middle schools, um, in grade eight, I had a chance to be exposed to computers back then. And this is when they were first coming out. And we're available in the school system. And, you know, frankly, at first I thought it was just a big, dumb calculator, right? A big, giant one, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> because we were doing math on it. It was not that very, it wasn't much fun. Yeah. But it was a friend of mine who was sitting next to me. And he started programming a game on it. And I was like, whoa, that'll do it. <laughs> you can be creative with these things? Wow, I had no idea. And really that light bulb moment for me, uh, being able to take creativity and, and plow it through this and, and do problem solving, 
my mind was going like nonstop for the next three or four years as a kid when I was trying to solve problems and, and try new things. And, and, you know, when I hit a problem and I, I coded a certain way and I think I'd solved it and it was like, no, it didn't work. And I'd, I'd have to rethink it and rethink it. It's the problem solving, critical thinking, uh, creativity, um, tenacity to stick at something until it, you finish it. That kind of thing, that, that kind of project-based or problem-solving you know, approach to things, I think it generally is missing in the school system in terms of how things are taught. That's all. Yeah. And so to me, it's not about, yes, we do need a lot more people that can understand um, coding and, uh, and robotics and automation and artificial intelligence and so on and so forth because that's kind of where a lot of the advances are coming in improvements and productivity improvements. Uh, in 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 industry and in 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 public service and everything, but to me, it's about if we could have every child graduating from uh, high school with a comfort in problem solving, and not just regurgit you know taking facts and then giving them yeah. back out, memorizing, giving them back out. Which I know it's not just about that. School is yeah. much more than that. But yeah. but a, a larger portion of their confidence coming from problem solving and critical thinking, I think that skill, regardless of where they go in their careers or um, in, in volunteering, whatever, will do them wonders. Yep. And I think it improves the province as a whole. Yep, critical thinking has um, kind of taken a bit of a pounding mm. the past 20 or 30 years. Um, very much, thank you for deepening that yeah, conversation. Yeah, no problem. And we can deepen it more if you want because in general, people will get their information from media. There'll be a paragraph here and a paragraph there, coding in the school. Some people might flash back and remember, oh, yes, a um, laptop program in the school. Uh, great idea, but then there's the implementation, the maintenance of all the equipment. Um, so there was, it was fraught with implementation problems because how do you handle an inventory of thousands of laptops? I mean, yeah. So you've got this tool, but then you need the ability to teach how to use the tool and... and so they might confuse the conversation around coding with a past experience with, you know, putting technology in the schools. Meanwhile, yep. there's this huge demand for trades, and we've taken that out of the school. So there is a system. I mean, all of that education system needs a tweak of some sort, maybe more than a tweak. Yeah, and you talked about education earlier. Um, do you have any, for instances, yet? It's, you said it's been three years now mm. playing, playing with this. Do you start to see any light in any tunnels that, um, you know, if we hang in there for a couple of years and we nudge it this way, something pretty dynamic can happen? Mm. And as well, can you teach us um, what percentage of uh, what percentage of all the activity in the province would be like the IT sector? I've always wondered, you know, this IT sector gets the attention. What percentage of, of the total revenue in the province? Is it like forestry or forest products? Is it this percent or is it this percent? And then what's its Mm. Yeah, so a couple of good questions there. So um, the, the first maybe the first way I'll tackle that is um, how this idea of getting coding back into the school, how it evolved was um, us deciding, and I say us, I mean a whole collection of people that kind of came out of the woodwork when we, when we first started talking about it, which was fantastic, uh, basically uh, tackling this with a, with a documentary called Code Kids, which eventually became a CBC doc. And... Um, and, and part of that was a trip to Estonia and really trying to understand what they did. And what we learned there, and also to Finland, and what we learned there is that um, rather than kind of like focusing on how do we get it put into the curriculum immediately and then everyone, you know, all the teachers, you know, are taught how to teach coding and all that kind of thing, is that we, it started in Estonia as a grassroots movement with an outside foundation. Uh, and they kind of funded the... Uh, the teachers that were willing to step up and try to incorporate coding or robotics or other things into the classroom, they would help you know fund a little bit of the acquisition of the kind of the tools that they needed, not big amounts, mm -hmm. and then allow that creativity to kind of flourish. And then it would inspire other teachers in the same school, perhaps, that them trying to do something. And it kind of grew exponentially that way. And so we said, well, we should probably do something similar. Um, and so it was. Uh, the formation of Brilliant Labs, um, which uh, happened the, in the previous government, um, that was um, 
really it was some money that was set aside and we were able to create, and this is very unique again, this is what a, a learning process it was like, this is the first time it was like, well, let's create something outside of government, but that works with government and works with teachers, but at a grassroots level up. And let's, and, and let's also design it using kind of collective impact kind of approach where we look at what else, uh, who else and what other organizations that exist out there that are kind of focusing in on this, like from sciences to Place of Competence to the tech mentors within the school system to teachers to parents, whoever, and kind of pull all those resources together and let's kind of collaboratively try to work to change the system that way. And <coughs> that formed Brilliant Labs, um, which you know has been growing ever since in the last three years to the point where not only do we work with the Departments of Ed here in New Brunswick, but we also have a partnership with the Department of Ed Nova Scotia and looks like potentially later this year, if all things go well, we'll also have a partnership with Department of Ed in Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland. So the idea of trying to bring in what I'll call, you know, experiential learning, uh, coding's a piece of it, but there's also just project-based learning, kids kind of using their hands, like, um, and, and getting in there and mucking around in maker spaces and, and building things <coughs> and trying things and experimenting. And, um, and in many cases, it's the teachers are changing from when they're doing this from one of I know everything and I purvey that knowledge to you to I am a coach. I am a ch I challenge you. So I, I, I kind of like as you start working on things and you hit a problem, <laughs> I don't solve it for you. I say, hmm, have you thought of that? And I let you keep experimenting yeah. and I think that kind of movement has been growing um, and it's I think we've reached well we've met tens of thousands of kids through this method um, thousands of teachers uh, and it continues to grow and you the second part of the question was around uh, percentage so yeah. I don't know exact the exact percentage I do know this is that if we have more uh, people choosing to kind of enter the stem or steam you know, science, technology, engineering, entrepreneurship, arts, and math kind of professions uh, or, or education, the more we get going into that and then choosing to work in startups or in co uh, companies focused on IT-oriented things or engineering-oriented things, um, there's just to reach the national average here, we'll add like hundreds of millions of dollars to our economy if we allow that to fully just to catch up with the rest of the country. And it, that's an example of just under underutilized potential. Pete, uh, I want to go explore that a bit um, because we don't hear that potential. We just hear um, sort of some results, some early results. We don't hear where it could go. Mm. We're also a culture that needed to make a leap. So often with other guests, I'll ask something like, um, we're so far behind, maybe we can just leap ahead. And I don't mean behind in a derogatory right. way. Um, so we were built on forestry, fishing, and farming. So and during the McKenna era, there was a lot of call centers that surfaced. There's a short-term fix for employment, but then you had an issue with languages and use of some technology. So have we reached a point in 2017 with people like yourself where the little province has a window that could really set us up for the next 50 to 70 to 80 years? Because that's what it sounded like as we slowly convert from you know, forestry at some point is going to be done um, because on the world market, the little provinces can't sustain itself. So then previous guest, Peter Linfield, said, we've got a 20-year window left roughly on some forest products. So how do we get to helping 28,000 people employ in that sector, roughly? And then how do we convert for the next generation coming up? It sounds like you've got a piece of that map to where it could go. Can, can you... Like where where can it go? Can it come from being ten percent of the total? If we had a a pie chart and this much is forestry and this much is fishing and this much is civil service for job opportunities or revenue streams for the province, and here's IT and it started off at three percent, now it's about ten percent, but its potential growth is that. Yeah. So a great question. Um, so this this there's a couple of things that I'll mention. Like one. Um, What's interesting about, you know, like software oriented startups that often I've been part of is that you're, you take an idea 
that's potentially disruptive in the world in terms of potentially improving things. Okay, and you can it's all zeros and ones. It's, you know, it's it's literally you know other than you know office space, and even then these days you don't even necessarily have office space. You can just everyone can work at home and sew it together type thing. But yeah. you're dealing with minds. It's like you're basically uh, it's people. It's thinking. It's creating something out of nothing, literally, okay, and creating value uh, in order to potentially solve a problem, right, using software anywhere in the world. And that's the thing. It's not necessarily, but so it, in fact, it probably shouldn't be just solve a problem in your brand. It's solve a problem globally, okay, yes. and you should approach it that way. And so you can build global um, uh, uh, solutions from anywhere, okay, and that's the beautiful thing about the internet and, and so on and so forth is you can be anywhere and you can solve problems, okay, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley or Toronto or New York, it doesn't matter, you can be here, it's okay. So from that perspective, it's a highly exportable process, like if you have minds that are thinking of creative ideas and you can get people together and you can solve global problems, you can create value which creates jobs and so on and so forth. So as an industry, <laughs> there's not a lot of, you know what I mean, pushback, like yeah. you literally, it's like, open season on on creating value and creating jobs that's the first point the second the second point is all those traditional industries you mentioned they're all global yes and often you create these products there's probably a physical range to them in terms of like shipping you know what i mean like they yeah. serve certain markets but um they generally are they're operating in a global marketplace okay so the prices are set globally um where you know they're competing against players all around the world if that's the case, then coming up with new innovative approaches to either find ways to uh, harvest things better or um, uh, create new products with you know either the, the actual like what you're producing the raw material or the byproduct of the raw material, right? Yeah. Um, or or finding new ways to combine that with technology or there's so there's a lot of things from that perspective. Not to mention that there's certain trends happening, mm -hmm. right? Um, Take, for instance, the call center industry. So one of the things that we're seeing a lot of these days is the idea of using artificial intelligence and these things called chatbots, right? And, you know, frankly, at this point, it's pretty early on and it's a bit clunky. But at some point, artificial intelligence gets to the point where it can handle a lot more of the kind of basic requests that people might have, right? And a lot of – we're moving away – not necessarily – um, from customer service and customer care, but we're moving from maybe telephone based to online, right? Chatting, you know, this and that, whatever, online, uh, um, maybe it's texting, that kind of thing. So it's more becoming more digital. So it's like, well, why wouldn't we take all the knowledge that we have around call centers and what, how to serve customers and take that knowledge and say, how can we take advantage of this new trend in AI and come up with new products and new solutions? Right, and grow that industry that way because it is going to transform and be disrupted. So rather than being disrupted, be the disruptor. And so I think there's a lot of potential in all of those industries. And you know, when it comes down to it too, and you mentioned something earlier, I didn't get a chance to I'll, I'll kind of combine it in here too, is that a lot of our resource-based industries we, we need people in the trades, right? And we talked about school and the need to kind of bring in the trades again, right? So imagine, you know, bringing in the trades, bringing in kind of this whole maker movement kind of stuff, bringing in technology and, 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 and more coding and that kind of thing, and smashing them all together. Because frankly, in the world today, that's when you go into work in a, in a job, they are smashed up together, <laughs> right? So let's smash them together in school in a really creative way so that kids come back, come out of school, understanding the trades, understanding how things are made, understanding how to get a computer or a robot or something to work for you doing the repetitive stuff so that you spend more time on the creative stuff. Mm -hmm. If we, we accept that, that that's the way the world's going and it is, and we want to be leaders at that. There's no reason why New Brunswick can't be. Yeah. Yeah. That'd make a good tagline for the province. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't be. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which would be counterintuitive to how most others see us. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> There's a dynamic tension in between the gaps of what you say, because mm -hmm. um, there might be some out there watching that'll go, "Yeah, and technology is taking away jobs." So, um, you know, built on your premises, this will make things better. Mm -hmm. So, that question of what is the good is always an interesting question to ask. And is there a balance, or can you see an emerging balance between how technology and innovation goes into an area and it shifted or disrupts? The job market. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of food industry. Um, you see more and more 
just walking in and tapping on your thing and ordering your food because it, it was more efficient for McDonald's or one of the other chains? Um, or do you see a different balance emerging so that it does free up time for the human being to go do other things? Can, can you wander into that space a bit? Yeah. Um, so two kind of trends there. One would be the fact that technology is always, it's always adapting, you know, the traditional stuff. It always is. Uh, and because we live in a global world, a global marketplace, um, if you're not thinking about how can technology improve your offering or how can you kind of like find innovative ways of delivering things or improve efficiencies or improve customer experience or that kind of thing, um, if you don't do it, someone else is, yeah. and they will eat your market. Like they'll eat up all your, like your customers will go to them, right? Yeah. So it's kind of in a way, it's not, you can, you know, it's the, you can kind of cover your eyes and cover your ears and just like hope <laughs> that things don't change, but they do, yeah, right? They do. So it's really about how do you adapt and get ahead of it and be the leader in that space, right? So that's the first thing. Um, I think, um, <sighs> The other, the other kind of the other trend that we're seeing too is towards you know as automation, as you know robots and artificial intelligence and so on and so forth start to kind of like um, replace. And again, this has been happening over the years. So it's, it's just kind of accelerating now, but it replace a lot of jobs that can be very repetitive. Right? We have to kind of accept that that's going to happen. And I don't know the, the time frame is you know it's hard. Like some people say it's yeah. going to happen really fast, some people say it's going to happen over over you know a manageable amount of time. But it is probably going to happen. So you have to accept that. So as a society, it's like you also have to start thinking about, well, if certain, if we're going to move to a world where there's less time, there's more time, personal time, right? Yeah. And uh, there's going to be kind of like, what's the world going to look like? It's like, well, what does that mean for, for you know, social policies? Yeah. What does that mean yeah. for what we do as, as human beings? Um, I, I mean... I don't know if anyone really has the answer to that. And frankly, I mean, it's kind of mind boggling because it's, yeah. it is such a drastic shift yep. uh, that I, I don't even know if I've got, you know, even scratched the surface on what that's going to mean. All I know is that um, if you, if you're thinking about a career, it's really about, you know, number one, it's pick something that you're going to enjoy doing. Yeah. Okay. Pick number two, kind of, Absorb the trends that, or take a look at the trends in terms of how certain careers that are, I'll call them repetitive, or there's a repetitive aspect of the career. What if you remove the repetitiveness of it, right? The stuff that happens over and over again that something could then, you know, automate, then what's left over? And if whatever's left over, and I think every career, there'll still be stuff left over. There'll still be a lot of critical thinking. This is the critical thinking part again, critical thinking, problem solving, because yeah. no matter what. It's going to take a long time before computers and artificial intelligence and so on and so forth can adapt to be better at what's in our heads between our ears right now, right? It's going to take a while to really get to that point. So there'll always be a need for people in careers to be problem solving and solving the problems that the repetitive stuff is, it, it's outside the box. Yep. So if you like a certain career, then spend time thinking about how, what I could do in the outside the box kind of stuff, right? The stuff that's that's not repetitive in every career, frankly, yeah. and that's the thing you should focus on as a person. Um, and it, frankly, I think it'll be really rewarding for you to think about it that way too, because yeah. it's it's more challenging, it's more interesting, change more often uh, in terms of variety and so on and so forth. And I think that's where we're going to move to one of where every day you, you could probably potentially get more variety and more challenges to, to challenge yourself. Yeah. Um. So there was a story in the Globe and Mail, uh, beginning of the summer, robotics mm -hmm. um, distribution center for, I think it was Sobeys. So in order to compete with Walmart in their massive distribution and supply chain, um, Sobeys has adapted using technology in this mega warehouse. It's displaced three or 400 people, and it's now run by 15 or 20 people. And we have smaller scale of that happening at Moosehead in um, St. John, where automation, because it's repetitive task. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be the clutch in the mechanism of the government, of trying to help them adapt and shift gears and go new directions, there's going to be a natural tension to the implementation of new technologies with the displacement of people from the workplace. Um, when you were talking earlier, it reminded me of Alvin Toffler's book, um, Future Shock, from the 70s. 
when he talked about this leisure class that would emerge because technology would create all this time and space for humans to go do creative endeavors. Um, and over the past 50 years, we've seen something else happen. The work week is now 50, 60, 70 hours. I have to work two jobs in order to maintain what one job used to in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Automation and technology had a lot to do with that. It's also how humans have chosen to implement it. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a science fiction future for New Brunswick, if we were to make a science fiction movie <laughs> here uh, about our society, um, can you give us a direction that kind of integrates maybe in a more healthy way? Uh, that balance between um, human free time because technology has freed us up or human struggle because technology replaced us. Mm. Yeah, that's... Um, Is that a conundrum for you? Yeah, yeah well, you know... Because we're heading there one way or the other. I know we are. There. And and I, I don't... I wouldn't I wouldn't be the first one to, at all to say I have the answers to that. Um, I, I will say that that the the trends like, I guess for me as a, again as a systems thinker I just look at stuff what what are what are some of the things that you can affect right personally affect yourself mm -hmm. you know um, those are the only things you really can change and you really can you know adapt and you know whatever so uh, I think in many ways everyone has to look it, I guess the thing would be is that if if you ignore that that's when it that's when it causes a lot of tension that's when it causes a lot of frustration if you're kind of like your head's down and like I, I don't accept that I don't want to keep going and doing why can't things just stay the same um, in certain maybe certain things in life do stay the same like the sun generally rises at the same time and yeah. sets at the same time right um, you know we're gonna have eclipse that's what someone was saying on the radio today you know eclipses you can kind of depend on them. they'll they're going to happen at a certain day and they will do that because the solar system continues to do the planet still keeps turning and so on and so forth so you know, there's certain things that you can depend on but when it comes to you know uh, evolution of of thinking and approaches and solving problems and everything else, there's always people solving problems around the world and making things different, better, stronger, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes those forces can be going the opposite direction too, there's no question. Um, but those are kind of things that you, sometimes you have to look at and say, do I accept the trend or do I push back against the trend? Mm -hmm. um, and if I accept the trend because it's, it looks like it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of time, then it's what do I need to do differently in order to be either to accept that part and how does that affect me and my, my family, uh, my, the future generations, uh, my community, community. And, and what do I do to help it either adapt or what do I do to uh, embrace that and build on top of that trend, right? You know, how do we become, a, how do we become leaders at, at something rather than followers or how, how do we, be, like I said earlier, how do we become the disruptor rather than the, the disrupted, yep. right? Yep. Um, and when I say disruptor, I say it in, in a positive way. I yeah, think you mean it as a systems change thing. That's right, that's yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of say, you know, if things are going to change, let's be the change agent rather than the one that gets changed and yep. kind of gets, you're like, let's, let's be the dog rather than the tail, right? Yep. Let's not be yep. wagged, let's wag, wag the tail, so, yeah. Can, can we slide in a slightly different direction, but still with that same impetus that you've got? Um, food. You know, one of those things that needs to change is security in our own food supply. We import 90% of our own food. There's a natural fit, in a way, between technology and food production nowadays, and there's an awful lot of people, especially young people, looking for meaningful work. And it used to be part of New Brunswick's identity, mm -hmm. you know, forestry, fishing, and farming. Mm -hmm. Forestry and fishing, fishing persevere. The farming one has struggled uh, mightily because of the global market for food. Mm -hmm. Major changes in weather patterns, climate changes, I'm shifting where food production is occurring. You can see 20 years from now that there's going to be a, a challenge and a, definitely a higher cost. Um, do you see a fit? Is it on your radar at all with, with New Brunswick's identity, um, this coding, imagination, young people moving through? And then maybe part of that answer for here's work that you can have where technology and work fit together. Not only that, but it's food. It's mm. fundamental to mm. who we are. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's uh, the there's a couple things that, and again, I, I'm not I'm not an expert at this, but just definitely kind of no go play. We just created yeah. a conundrum for you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, like So there's play. a couple of things where I've I've thought of around that. So one would be around um, you know when it comes to, and I've looked at this personally just because I'm also interested in food and food security and that kind of thing and. Um, 
and, and for me also just looking at how food's produced, you know, the, the organic versus the, you know, the, the traditional and, and like what, how do you, you know, the amount of chemicals used first to, you know, that kind of thing. So as, as a person, as, you know, someone who's also part of a family and, and community. So uh, what's interesting about technology, we're at a bit of a cusp on a couple of things. One, we're on the cusp of um, uh, solar and battery technology really kind of being much like if you look at it there it's on a technology curve so uh, it's part of Moore's law so it, it, it actually can get it gets getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so the the idea of being able to grab the energy of the sun store it and then use it you know to kind of like stabilize something is there or it's getting there it's pretty darn close um, the use of uh, hydroponics or aquaponics right uh, the you know you have being able to kind of again stabilize something, grow stuff in a climate year round, yes, right? Closed loop, closed loop, right? Um, we certainly have lots of land. Okay, mm -hmm. now granted, that's that kind of juxtaposed against uh, hydroponics, aquaponics is that you don't necessarily use, use soil. You can use stuff other than soil, right, in order mm -hmm. to grow things. So, but we do have lots of land for that perspective. Now, let's take a look at another trend. We have a lot of because we have a lot of land. Um, that's, you know, farmland that used to be used. I mean, it, the problem is when land's not used, as I've discovered, because I own a bit of farmland and I have someone that actually, uh, we let, they let them use it for, uh, you know, basically so that it, it stays farmland. Because if you don't use it, it yeah. just grows up in alders and, and it grows up and then it's no longer, you have to clear it again, right? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the idea is that, you know, how do, you, how do we make sure that we don't lose this farmland? So, you know, one of the things we saw is a lot of Syrian, uh, the folks, the Syrian um, immigrants that have come to the, uh, our province, in many ways may have the trades or may have you know some farming backgrounds and that kind of thing. So it's like there's an example of social innovation. How can we potentially match up uh, people that have this uh, these skills or you know have a, a base of skills to then match them up with land that's kind of sitting idle and to start producing more food locally, as an example. Um, one of the other things that I've, I, you and I chatted about a couple of weeks ago is the idea of um, thinking about how to solve food problems at, 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 a, at a large scale. And then by getting it at a larger scale, you get at economies, right? Because that's part of the problem with yes. local food production, right? Is yep. if, you don't, if you don't create scale, then when you're going up against these mega farms, the prices just aren't there, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the cost of shipping plus... A, uh, and the cost of, you know, the lower cost of a mega farm, if that's cheaper than growing it locally with, again, the the problems of shipping at a smaller scale again, yep. that's part of the, that's, it's, it's been economics in many cases so yep. as why things happen. Also, of course, there's also being able to track food, you know, you know, to make sure that there's a problem, right? To go backwards. So those yes. are, that's another system problem, right? Yes. So imagine if you can create a demand, pool demand, right? Um, and at the same time, create a, a, a software system or other types of things that allow smaller producers to be able to track food the way the bigger producers want, or the bigger like uh, chains or whatever want to see it or anyone wants to see it, be able to track, you know, if there's a problem in the food chain, as they say, yeah. you can go back and, and see it. And then at the same time, how do you use these modern techniques of growing to drive, you know, costs down or to, again, pool the ideas or pool energy or like it's the idea of pooling things together. So I'll give you an example of a, something we had talked about, the idea of how do we make sure that a whole generation of kids um, understand, you know, good healthy eating, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, since we are struggling with a, a bit of a generational poverty, poverty issue here in New Brunswick and in certain pockets, like in St. John where I'm from, yeah. um, it, is, it is a big problem and it's something we're all trying, we're tackling together. Um, but you know, food is a big part of it. You know, Maslow's hierarchy needs you need to have <laughs> shelter and food, right? Yeah. And so, um, school is an example where it's kind of the equalizer where all kids go to school, um, but not every one of them gets a, a healthy lunch, and not everyone gets even has a lunch what they bring to school. So, here's an example: How could we create a system where every child was, you know, had a healthy lunch at school? Now, you could say that sounds like a real expensive thing, and it would be a cost. There's no question. Um, but having traveled to two other countries to see what they've done at scale, for example, one, when we were in Finland shooting that documentary, um, in Finland, um, 
I had, when we were in the shooting school, I had a chance to go down and enjoy one of the kids' lunches. And the principal on the way down said, I'm so, so sorry, I apologize in advance. You know, we used to have our own chef, but now it's <laughs> stuff's brought in. And we only have 93 euro cents per child as a budget, you know, to do that, uh, to provide a lunch. Well, geez, the lunch was amazing. It was healthy. It was, um, the kids were all eating it. They were all eating spinach pancakes. I mean, imagine, <laughs> if you put that on the menu here, what? The kids would be eating that, but they were eating spinach pancakes, not with syrup on it, but with some sort of berry sauce, again, locally grown type of thing. But there was salads, there was all kinds of stuff at 93 euro cents. Now, do the math, 200 school days or whatever it would be, or 220 school days times 93 euro cents. Yeah. You're talking about a budget in our terms of around $400, $450 maybe, right? If I'm doing my math right. Yeah. Another country we went to, India. Uh, in India, to me, when I was there, um, the economy seemed to be at, at well, one eighth. So if you bought something here for a dollar, uh, you'd be buying something there for around 15 cents. Like, so the economy is so big yeah. that it had its own kind of pricing system inside, but it's still, you could do the math. You could say yeah. times eight and that would be the cost here. So there's a program there and I forget the name of it, but it's a fantastic program that literally we went into this food facility uh, where they were, uh, they produced healthy lunches, uh, Indian lunches, vegetarian lunches for um, kids within a geographic range of, I'm going to say, within an hour to an hour, two hours of driving from this facility. They produced 300, I think it was 390,000 meals a day and packaged up in little containers, okay, that were all stacked up. And they, those containers would come, come back that night on the trucks, be washed and done again. So again, not, not throwaway stuff, all like, yep. you know, good from the environment. And they produced that, and their budget for the year, if I'm remembering it right, was something like 60 Canadian, like $60. Okay, so times eight, now we're up to 480. So again, see the magic number. We're into that $450, $500 range, right? So that is still money when I mean, you have to times it by the number of students that we have. But when you think about the amount that we spend on education per child and divide that out, it's something like, I think, around between $12,000 and $13,000 a year, right? So... $500 tacked into that, yes, obviously it's significant, but in the greater scheme of things of, of delivering education or delivering, like educating our ch child, children, imagine if we found a way to be innovative, to find a way to kind of tuck that in, right? Yep. We, and we, got, <laughs> we figured out a way of doing it at scale. Think about it. We don't have 390,000 students. We have like roughly, you know, whatever, 90 to 100,000 students. So we're at one third the problem that one facility I was in. See what I mean? Yeah. But if we could produce things at scale and do it in a way that we're producing healthy meals and so on and so forth, and we pool our resources yeah. and maybe we, we get stuff from the locally grown farmers. So we're creating a system of demand and we're in all that kind of thing. And we're developing a system of, of shipping things around. We actually can solve these problems. Yep. We just have to find a way to pool our, our thinking together, I think. Yep. That was beautiful. <laughs> was that fun? <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I mean, you can tell I get excited about this, but yeah. it's, it, I mean, these are the, the but, realm of possibility that if you want to tackle it, we can do it. But it's beautiful on so many levels because it's been a systemic problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, entrenched poverty or, or generational poverty. Um, systems that can't seem to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, here's how you build a community. You've got a hospital and a school. Um, demographic shifts, with people going to different communities. Um, New Brunswick, uh, on one hand, will say, well, you know, one degree of separation, we all know each mm -hmm. other, we should be able to move quickly. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, we'll, we'll divide by North, South, or English, French, and, and we'll struggle. Um, depends which story you go through. Um, and then there's the distribution issue that's changed. But to hear stories like that, and to know that it's an issue of scale, and it would be a little bit of letting go mm -hmm. of the old way of doing things. But that becomes more possible when they hear what you just shared. Oh, that's the direction we can go. Well, that's quite exciting. And people will let go of old ways of doing things if they can see mm -hmm. the exciting part in, in front of where it could go. Um, can we flip a little bit? Sure. Is something different? You recently had an announcement of a personal project that you've got going down in St. John. You want to share that a little bit? Yeah, so there's a... Um, I've, I've always played uh, kind of an entrepreneurial role in various companies over the years. And then, and cause I kind of think kind of that I have that kind of entrepreneurial thinking mind of like problem solving. I'll call it in other yeah. terms, problem solving. And, but it's always generally been zeros and ones or ideas <laughs> in those businesses. They never had actual product or physical locations or physical things. But this is the first one. Um, it's kind of, a, it's a family thing that we, 
idea that uh, that we had, and it was really around because as as uh, as a family, whenever we travel on vacation, we always like doing physical um, activities, right? Um, we aren't necessarily the type to kind of just sit on a beach. We do, if we did, we'd be we'd probably be in the water doing something, you know, yeah. trying to learn something or yeah. playing on playing something on the beach. So, but so when when we were away, uh, we always see these other ideas and we're like, why why don't we have that back home? Wouldn't that be great if we could do this? Now, generally, we talk about it, but we generally don't do it because we're all busy doing different things. But in this case, it was like the idea was compelling enough, and I had to, I guess I had the it was a certain point in life. I said, what the heck when you start investigating, but it's the idea of creating an aerial adventure kind of park, mm -hmm. uh, treetop adventures, um, in St. John. And so about three months ago, it just started to kind of pick away at it. Started to say, well, is it possible? You know, like there, a couple of them exist other parts of New Brunswick now. And there's yeah. a few, there's one in PEI and there's a couple in Nova Scotia. And it's in, in, as a more, I started looking into it. It's a growing trend. It's, it's, it's really kind of exploding in North America. Uh, we, uh, the, the business is called Timber Top, and uh, the idea is basically to create kind of a high ropes course uh, in Dominion Park, uh, which is in right in the middle of St. John uh, on the west side, uh, and um, and basically have it so that you know people who want to enjoy something get out in the woods, enjoy nature, uh, and also give themselves a, a good solid challenge. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it's a solid challenge. Yeah. Uh, I actually did the the uh, Nova Scotia Park. Uh, one of the Nova Scotia ones uh, a couple days ago, and you know I'm telling you, I, you, you get to choose the level of difficulty you want because there'll be different courses sure. that you can choose. Uh, you can start if you have a fear of heights and you're like, I want to get over that first. You can pick the ones at a lower elevations, and then oh, I'm, I'm getting better at this, and you can start keep going on. Or, or if you feel like you're ready for a big physical challenge, you could you choose higher ones up up, up the of the difficulty chain, similar to when you go to a ski hill, yeah. and. Um, yeah, so so it, you survive it. I, I survived it. <laughs> this is day two, right? But so two day, the day after you say, "Well, I feel great," and it's always the second day. Whether you feel the muscles that you really use, yeah, and I'm okay. So <laughs> I guess it's okay, you know, from that perspective. But but yeah, it's a good good workout and it's good fun adventure for for families and for anyone that wants to get out and enjoy nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I didn't want us to talk in and not touch on that because um, it's it's a. Uh, it's a fun thing, and anything that helps promote um, physical activity and a bit of tourism and all. Though I, I want to, there was a zipline thing that tied to that powerboat that was on the other side of um, Reversing Falls mm -hmm. down in Saint John. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same as that, right? Because yep. the zipline thing was mainly three or four that went back and forth. Yeah. And uh, please put up a sign so people can find it, because it was always one of those challenges. <laughs> That zipline thing and that speedboat, um, mm -hmm. the signage was kind of minimal off of Douglas. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those pet peeves that like New Brunswick needs to do a whole sign strategy yeah, well, so we can find things. It's interesting because I was in <laughs> Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia. And you're right. I mean, there is, there's more kind of tourism-oriented signage to find things. And, yeah. um, and I was thinking about that as well going, you know, like I think, I mean, the, the good news is, is that um, tourism... Um, it has so much potential in New Brunswick. We're a diamond in the rough, really. Uh, I had a chance to speak at a conference on tourism innovation about two months ago, and um, there was a an expert in from uh, BC uh, who travels around the world working with tourism organizations, and he did a great presentation on like the. He truly loves New Brunswick in terms of its potential. Yeah. He just loves it. And he, well, he loves visiting too, but he he loves the potential. Um, and I and the and. The good news is, is that government also recognizes that there's a ton of potential. I mean, we're seeing a yes. lot of people, right? I mean, as you mentioned, we mentioned earlier, a lot more people are looking to travel. They want experiences. I mean, especially the millennial generation, it is more about experiences, right? Uh, it's also about finding like the undiscovered stuff, right? Like stuff that's just kind of like not the standard everyone goes to stuff. Yeah. And I think New Brunswick's just chock full of really cool experiences. To, from that to, perspective. Yeah, to share a personal experience on that uh, Fundy Trail, mm -hmm. walk along, run into a couple. Um, you chat a little bit because they ask how much further is the waterfall. <laughs> yeah. And and where are you guys from? Oh, we're from New York. Why are you here? Mm. Like, why are you in New Brunswick? Oh, we love it here because no one knows it's here. Mm. Um, so that chock full of potential, which then gets the counter push, would be. Some people like it because no one knows it's here. Right. So there's going to be an interesting conversation to be had one day to settle 
um, how many people you, you let through that turnstile. Yeah. So that you can always maintain the integrity of the environment, mm -hmm. that outdoor adventure, mm -hmm. and at the same time have a, the right scale, um, so a certain amount of um, well-being and business and sustainability can be integrated in. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, um, the global tourism and the amount of people that travel around the world, um, we would be like the tiniest percentage, <laughs> right? So, you know, like, it won't take much. It won't take much for us to just kind of be uh, position ourselves as, you know, kind of that undiscovered, you know, I, when I think about it, um, I like almost like uh, there was a campaign that uh, this expert was telling me about, and I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was, it was one of the Midwestern states or something. And uh, it was a commercial and it basically had um, the two, two old guys like in a, in a boat and they were fishing. And they were like, it was awesome fishing, right? And I think they were pulling, I don't know, pulling in different, you know, awesome fish and stuff like that. And then these, these tourists came along, right? And they had all the gear on the car and, you know, like the, the boat and, you know, all that stuff. And they stop and they get out on, it's like up on a bridge or something. And they're pulling out the map and they're like, then they know, like they're trying to find, assuming like they're trying to try some good fishing. And they see the, the old guys in the boat and they're like, just prior to that, the old guys, they saw this car coming. They kind of hid everything. Right, they hit all the fishing poles. They they put out like an old ratty old fishing pole rather than the great gear and everything. And these guys and the tourists were like, "Hey, uh, guys over there across the lake, any good fishing? No, no good fishing here. You know, head down the highway to the next state, no problem." Well, and then as soon as they took, took they took off, up came the good gear again. Well, it's kind of like the, New Brunswick has this really amazing stuff, and I, I always think like if if people have like let's be a little bit sassy, like. You know, it's like, um, you know, uh, you know, no great fish, no great salmon fishing here. Winky, you know, like yeah. the little wink, you know, or no yeah. awesome, you know, um, world class, res uh, uh, world oil, well, like the way St. Andrews got the best, like, location yeah, for away. tourist town or, tourist or town. trail system. Exactly. Uh, best trail system or best this or best that. Like, winky, don't have it here. Winky, keep going. You know, it's yeah. like, it's the kind of underground kind of, yeah. oh, wait a minute. They're trying to trick me. There's got to be some good stuff here. I got to explore, and it's the explorers. I think that's that category of people that will love New Brunswick because there's so much to explore. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, ten years ago when I used to do a lot of geocaching. Uh, I uh, chose my 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 handle was Doctor Livingston. That's what I called myself because it was like it was it was a chance to it, it was like literally I was exploring. In New Brunswick, finding stuff that was like such cool things, you know, just from that perspective. And I think that's truly New Brunswick. It's yeah. plans to explore and see amazing things. Fine. Yeah. Uh, one more theme I'd like to travel down. Sure. And the theme is success. Um, let's play with like what is success because it keeps shifting. Um, when I've had a chance to speak to some people, um, small groups, and say, uh, and I used Radian 6 as one of the examples mm -hmm. and imposed a conundrum, tried to pose a conundrum. So Radian 6 is held up as a measure of success, especially in the IT world for the sellout or the, the sales force. Mm -hmm. um, and the media will give it a dollar figure and an impact figure and, and whoa, you know, mm -hmm. and see the dollar signs and the stars rolling. But what about the mom and pop shop that's the home hardware store that's been there for 35 years where Radian 6 lifespan was, what, seven years, six years? Um, took about about five. Well, I think it was either four and a half to five years from idea to when it was acquired by, by Salesforce. Still keep yeah. going strong, but it's yeah. part of Salesforce. Yeah, because now. that's the nature of that industry, yep. right? You come up yep. with ideas, and then, right. and then they get applied on a bigger scale. Right. So it was a bunch of twenty somethings. You know, so it's so success. Like, is the mom and pop shop that runs the home hardware store and been there for twenty five years and stayed at a certain level, didn't have a big sell of cash out, mm -hmm. or radiant six. And, of course, there's a certain lure to the world that you've lived through. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to play with that? Because uh, it would be nice if there was a better balance. And success is measured not just in these terms. Because media will tend to glamorize yes. that. And so can we deepen the conversation on what is successful and your version of what that means? Yeah, be? so to me, I think, um, and look, what's interesting about, you know, kind of going into the the business of tourism and you know timber top is it's not a startup it's not meant to be you know what i mean it's <laughs> yeah it really is a mom and pop shop type thing where you're 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 finding a unique thing that the market is been you know as you do your research the market's telling you we need we need it we want it we've tons of great feedback 
looking forward to it. It's a unique product that doesn't exist in the marketplace today in, you know, St. John region. So it's like, we'd love to have it. And it, so to me, um, it's, they're similar that way. So a startup is basically saying, you know, like in the technology sector, it's like we're creating this thing that's going to solve this problem that we see globally. Um, and so that people can add that to their toolbox in terms of other businesses, right, to use it yeah. to improve how they do things, right? And that's what Radiant 6 was, is like, how do I help companies market and keep an idea in terms of what people are saying about them, uh, saying about them online? in a new world where it's not just about what they're, you know, picking up the phone and saying, or saying around the water cooler, but they're actually saying online. So the, the market was shifting. It was like, how do we help solve that problem for them? Right? Because it was becoming a bigger problem if you ignored it. And so, um, again, it's all about finding what the problem is or what the opportunity is, and then finding a way to build something that fulfills that need. And to me, the, the home hardware that, you know, or building center or whatever that opens yeah. up in a, in a community, that you know didn't have one, or had, or or there's a lot of growth potential. People are starting to build more homes, so there is one hardware store, but they could use another one with different products or different mix, mm -hmm. and that, and so on and so forth. That's entrepreneurial. That's also success as well. It's finding something, doing something that customers want, doing it well, um, and being able to build a team that's successful, enjoying what they're doing. Uh, hopefully, I would hope too that. Uh, any business when you're when you're creating something is always trying to find a way to impact the community in a positive way as well You know mm -hmm. the old triple bottom line kind of stuff, you know, how do I help the environment? How do I help a community? Um, you know, how do I get involved? Like, so now that there's something where employees and you know the, the owners are now employed and doing something they love and Doing something that customers love now have the ability to also because they you know, they checked a lot, you know, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're, they're, they're getting, they're making an income, they're making, you know, you know, some thing to allow them to, to live. Now it's like, how do I carve off some time at the same time to give back to my community? So how does that team of people maybe volunteer to do some sort of fundraiser or, you know, volunteer at an organization once a month or once every couple of weeks or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's kind of a holistic view. I think success is, you know, how do I, how do I impact the world in a way that it leaves it uh, a better place than what, what it, what, than what it was yesterday? I think that's success. Uh, and you know what? That could be solving a problem that businesses need. That could be making sure that you have, you have the boards that you need to build the thing yeah. you're building. Or yeah. how do you know in my community, it's someone who's who's in need has been given a, a helping hand. I mean, all of that is success. Great. Final thoughts. Something to send us out with. Um, Something we didn't touch on that you wanted to? Well, uh, yeah, I think really, um, I think one of the things uh, that's driven me um, and it dri drives a lot of people that I get a chance to spend time with, um, and, uh, and I include you two in this, Dennis, as well, because of, you know, yes, you interview people, but you're on a bit of a mission, too, to improve New Brunswick, and, and I think that's fantastic. I, I think that's the theme I th I'm hoping every New Brunswicker has. Yes, they're busy, they have their lives, they have their family, and so on and so forth, but it's, how can I do one thing every day that somehow improves something and tackles a problem? And that doesn't, I mean, you eat an elephant one bite at a time, and there's lots of big problems here, but instead of pointing to government, <laughs> you need to solve the problem, um, uh, yes, they could eventually acquire that idea that you might have to help solve that problem, but like I said, it is what it is right now. They don't have an R&D department. They don't have the, the wiggle room to kind of like just tackle like uh, new ideas very quickly. So it's really about getting it started. Get a bunch of people together that, you know, also believe that this could be a good solution. You know, figure it out. Pull together a bit of resources. Start trying it out. Does it have an impact? Then maybe get, you know, involve the civil service or involve people in the community. Um, in order to kind of start scaling that up and educating people that, wow, this might work, and then continue to build that up to the point where it actually it becomes very obvious that this is a better way of doing something to improve your community than maybe something that's traditionally been done. And then literally try to help it get migrated over to that new approach. Mm. Uh, to me, if every citizen kind of picked off something like that, was a problem solver, was a critical thinker, yeah. didn't just focus in on Yes, we can be frustrated, we can complain about stuff, but literally <laughs> got involved, yeah. acted on something in a positive way, 
right? Uh, and collectively did that with a number of people. If we all did that, uh, we can look back in 10 years and the province will have been like literally outstripped a lot of other provinces. And I think we're seeing a movement towards that. I'm certainly seeing a lot more people get involved doing that, which absolutely warms my heart to do when I see that. And so if I can be one of those people that kind of like maybe, you know, acts on what I'm talking about and maybe helps others to see that, yes, you can do the same thing. Because in the end, I may have this fancy title or whatever, but it's all, all I'm, I'm Joe Citizen, just trying to pick away at things as I can based on the experience and the, the um, uh, you know, skills that I have. And if everyone does the same thing, you don't need a fancy title to do that. <laughs> you can just start doing it on your own. Any, every, you can start today. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.